A novel by Paul McCann, the songwriter. Chapter One, Journey from the Crossroads. I was born in 1956 in the Jubilee section of Belfast City Hospital. I could not talk or think and arrived into the world with the umbilical cord tightly wrapped around my neck. As I turned blue, the doctor's steady hands rescued me from taking an early exit from life. My mother tells me my arrival was quite distressing for all concerned. Anyhow, on the 10th of March, I came into the world and seven days later on St. Patrick's Day, I was baptised in Holy Cross Church in Ardoin. My father's name was Samuel Joseph and his people came from Sailor's Town, a place that sprung up around the city docks. His father, my grandfather Frank, had moved out of there during the troubles of the twenties. With a hand card he made his way from his family home in Grapatrick Street along the cobblestone streets up the Antrim Road until he saw the new village of Ardoin or Edenderry as it was known originally. He put the front door key into a home in 38 Jamaica Street and soon set up a happy home with his wife Sarah. My grandmother Sarah was crippled in a wheelchair most of her life and it was left to my Aunt Mary and Rita to look after her. They did everything for my grandmother. It was hard, but they had a great love and never complained. The new home in Jamaica Street had a bathtub, and that was a luxury for them. In their old house in Gerpatrick Street, all they had was an old steel tub that hung up on a wall, and every Friday night it came down for the weekly bath. Everyone bathed on Friday night. From its early beginnings, Ardoin had a big heart and took in people from all over the city. It's a place that had to survive. History tells us that Michael Andrews from County Down opened a business in Belfast and had secured a number of acres in the townland of Edenderry. It was here in Edenderry where Michael Andrews established a hand loom factory and refurbished what few old homes were there and his business grew. He gradually added more workers' homes until the attractive little village with its bell tower and clock, its pebble square and its bell man calling out the hours at night, its snow-white homes, its school, its court pitch and its little factory became one of the leading attractions for the people of Belfast City. All these were there and flourishing in the mid-1800s. The town land of Edenderry, although immortalised with the today's small business people, like the Edenderry Post Office and Edenderry National School, the name passed from the lips of the people and Ardoin took its place. Up the road from Edenderry is Laganil. In days gone by, Laganil and its hill of white lime quarries provided the base for many of the road surfaces around Belfast. In those far-off days of the 1850s, limestone from the White Mountain was used to surface the Crumlin, Laganil and the Shankill roads. On these snowy white roads in the summer time, the glare was blinding. The whiteness increased day by day by tons of white powder that poured through the white joints that were open inside the bright red carts that were full of limestone coming down from the White Mountain. Before I was born, my small village in North Belfast had seen many changes over the centuries. The name Ardoin means basically John's Hill. To this area, Michael Andrews brought people work and homes and a well-loved, never-to-be-forgotten name and one that is known all over the world. My mother and her parents had lived in Glenard, which some people said was the upper-class section of Ardoin. I don't know how anyone could make that assumption with the entire population of Ardoin all struggling to make a living. My mother's dad was called Richard Robinson. My mother's mother was called Mary Clare. My grandfather was a good musician and a popular man at the parties. He performed regularly at many venues in Ireland and in England. Most people called him Dick. Sadly though, my grandfather died very young. After going to London 
for work. He contracted pleurisy, I'm told, during to living in a damp and dirty bed and breakfast where he had taken up short residence. It wasn't that long after he returned to Belfast he died, leaving my grandmother Mary heartbroken. Then it wasn't long after that when she herself died. With both her parents dead, my mother, who was just 12 years old, found herself all alone in the world. Tragedy struck with no mummy's kisses and no daddy's smiles. All she got was the whispers and stares from the neighbours and relatives who wanted to send her into an orphanage. But from a very early age, my mother stood on her own two feet and told them all to get out of her house. She took on a full-time job in the mill and worked as hard as any of them in the dark and dirty spinning mill of Belfast. There were not many good times for her, and in all the time she was growing up alone, not one offered her a helping hand. She worked hard at the Rosebank Mill in Flax Street, where nothing came easy, and she loved to go to the Irish dancing whenever she got the chance and found a friend in Patsy McGowan. Her life changed after a holiday to the Isle of Man, where she met Sam, who was also on holidays. Some came from Old Ardoin and they met again at the Ardoin social dance. It wasn't long and they both fell in love. The rest is history. Sammy and Mary, my parents, were married on the 20th of June 1953 in Holy Cross Catholic Church in Ardoin. They had five children, Marion, Geraldine, Terry, Sarah and myself. The only boy. I grew out of my short trouser days and started Butler Street Primary School. Following that, I went on to St Gabriel's Secondary School on the front of the Crumlin Road. St Gabriel's was in walking distance from our home in Ardoin. Before school each day, I had a regular job helping to deliver milk for the Belfast Co-op. After the last bottle of milk was delivered, my day at school began. Most days I had no time to change clothes, so I went to school wearing my soaking wet, stinking sour milk smell well-loved black duffel coat. Fair play to all my old school friends who were in their early years. I went to school and never ever once did anything or anyone ever said anything about the smell of the duffel coat. There's a lot to be said for friends who accept you who you are. For three years I worked on the milk run with Noel Benson who drove the small electric co-op milk van. I earned 10 shillings a week and saved that money in a big biscuit tin that I kept right and handy for as sure as Christmas would come, birthdays would soon follow and I always made sure that my parents and sisters had a gift. I was a football fanatic and played every day after school in Dunedin Park. Usually it was 32 aside and no rules applied. You just had to get the ball and kick it before anyone else got to it. The goals were the space between the lamppost and the hedge at Mrs McGowdy's and the other way was the place between the lamppost and Mrs Liddy's fallen down fence. There were some great games. We played though through to the long twilight hours and into the last faint light of the day. That was back when Peelers walked the street and often took our ball and wrote our names in his book. I grew up with a handful of great football players and we became very close friends. Most of us with our nicknames ended up playing for our local St Gabriel's Youth Club and we won the Down and Connor Cup in 1966, beating St Patrick's 2-1 in a long drawn out final at Celtic Park in West Belfast. My non-football friends were like the secret unknown few who I visited frequently and quietly when no one else was around. We swapped comics and traded coins and we even shared ghost stories and jokes if time permitted. But there was one thing nobody in the entire world knew. I had a secret identity and a personality that I could and would never share with anyone until now. I can still remember the night I became a poet. It happened so suddenly. One night before going to sleep, I felt a great urge to write. Words flooded into my mind. It was as if God's hand turned a top of inspiration from heaven itself that began to run through my head. I got out of bed and grabbed a pen 
and a notepad and started to write like a madman. I couldn't believe what was happening before my very eyes. I was writing the most beautiful prayers and poems that you could never imagine. Born was the poet, but I was too much self-conscious and so reluctant to tell anyone about this transformation of a nong to a poet. I had now a secret life where I wrote every day and night. I was very sensitive about this new gift and so always hid my poems and prayers in my bedroom and under the floorboards of the house. My life was changing fast and I was experiencing other things no one would believe. One night as I slept in the attic, I awoke from my sleep and felt cold and aware of another presence there in my room. Outside, I could hear the sound of cats crying on the backyard walls. I sat up in bed and glanced over at my bedroom window and felt my hair stand up. In the corner of the room, I saw a figure of a strange woman dressed in a long shroud. She was there a few feet from me. She was motionless and just stared at me. I tried to scream out, but my voice was blocked. I was locked in a state of sheer terror and pulled the quilt over my head. And I shook with fright for a while. Eventually I had another peep to see if the lady was still there, but my night visitor had left. The next morning I told my sisters and mum and dad about the experience of the night before. It was hard to convince my parents about the ghostly intruder. They said it was just a bad dream, and there was nothing to fear. But one thing's for sure, I didn't want to sleep in the attic ever again after that. All my sisters seemed to believe me. Anyhow, after a time away, my parents convinced me to return to my attic bedroom. Well, to my great relief, I was never troubled again by that operation, though it still was hard for me to feel at peace there. As time went on, My inspiration flourished and my writing became very prolific. Through the entire house in Dunedin Park I scattered my poetry. Inside the gas meter box and under the lino, inside torn mattresses and anywhere I could find an empty slot. They were my little treasures and I was very protective of them. I felt they were part of the house like bricks and mortar. Soon... I found music and tuned in to the pop music of the pirate radio station called Radio Caroline. At night I also listened to Radio Luxembourg and music flooded into my life with the Beatles, the Rolling Stones and new songs from CCR, Creedence Clearwater Revival and Gilbert O'Sullivan, Edison Lighthouse, Slade, T-Rex, Mungo Jerry. Also these people made a great impact on me. I embraced life and it was good. I threw myself into its open arms. Suddenly something shattered the foundations of life we lived and enjoyed in Belfast. It was in 1968 when the first signs of trouble arrived in our streets, in Ardoin. Daily rats and running gunfights. It wasn't long before Ardoin became a battlefield. The village pavements were littered with bricks and broken glass, nail bombs, and petrol bombs were thrown from the innocent hands of children. The movement began to strike a blow and the cause was right to blow our city asunder. The bloodbath of Belfast had just begun. The poetry and prayers I wrote were washed away in the madness and the dreams I had as a child were awoken by the daily nightmare of death and destruction. The hopes my parents had for us changed and the future was unsure. Things were changing rapidly. Life on the streets was daily death at the door. Each new dawn brought to light the reality of what once was Belfast. Our youth club at St Gabriel's closed due to the troubles. My Protestant friends were told not to visit me anymore. Newspaper photographs and journalists had placed themselves on both sides of the fence. Graphic footage of the troubles in Northern Ireland now was on the TV screens all over the world. The world was aware. We had a serious situation developing in Northern Ireland. Days and nights of violence continued with no end in sight. The entire province was at war. 
Snipers placed themselves on rooftops as riding mobs clashed below in the streets. It was as if civil war had just begun. Blood had been spilt on the streets where I had built friendships and played football. Coffins of people I went to school with were being carried into cemeteries that were running out of space. As the dead were being buried, others were already preparing to get revenge. The prisons and hospitals filled quickly, and it was clear that the forces of law and order had lost control of the situation. The police reserves, known as the B-Specials, ran amok through Ardoin, shooting people through their parlour windows as they sat watching their TV. The Royal Ulster Constabulary turned a blind eye to the murders and failed to intervene. Hatred was brewing towards the security forces and in the Catholic districts all over the north, riots began and guns came out on the street. I realised that it would never be the same again. The Northern Ireland I knew and loved had left and I watched helpless as my friends died. The town went mad. Everything was burned or looted. Buses were hijacked and as people tried to get out of the gunfire, they forgot what they were doing. Panic struck and good people went bad. The little houses of Belfast were being burned. Some say in the name of religion. Catholics were thrown out from their homes in Protestant districts and fear drove Protestants from their homes in the Catholic districts. New residents called the squatters began to move into Ardoin. They arrived on trucks accompanied by everything they owned. I remember the day my cousin Frankie arrived with his wife and family. Ardoin was under attack. The Protestants of Ardoin were moving out and to ensure no Catholic family would move into their house, they turned on the gas, broke the pipes and torched their homes. Hundreds of houses burned and a thick cloud of black smoke filled the sky. The horror of that event was seen all over Belfast City. That day a young lad I knew who had helped my cousin Frankie moved into Ardoin was shot dead. Leo McGuigan was his name and as he was unloading the truck with Frankie's furniture on it, a sniper on a rooftop shot him dead. At the court case they tried to say that Leo was an armed man and was shooting at the security forces. Frankie had to give evidence at court. Other witnesses also were called to give evidence and helped to clear Leo's name. No one was ever caught or arrested for his killing. The same can be said for my school friends who lost their lives in the Troubles. I can still see their innocent smiling faces. It's hard to forget people like Dodo Armstrong, murdered and mutilated by a gang of Protestant thugs in Clifton Street. They gave him a horrible death. Sean McKee, or Big Sid as he was known, was shot dead by the British Army. After Sid was shot, half of him was hanging, left, from the back of a Saracen tank. Eventually he was taken to the hospital, dead on arrival. The report said he was an IRA gunman firing at the British Army. I was out many times with Big Sid. I can remember every time there was any sign of trouble, he would have run off straight for home. Sid was a nice fella, and he didn't have a bad bone in his body. Some of my other friends who were murdered included Sean McConville, who was going steady with my sister Geraldine. He was shot dead on the Crumlin Road by a Protestant who stopped him in a car, asking for directions. Then there was Paddy shot by a Protestant on the front of the Crumlin Road. Foxy, as we called him, was shot by the security forces, and one by one every murder was accepted and swept under the carpet by the powers that be. The residents of Ardoin were asked to attend a meeting to form an action committee. Every street in the district had to elect two members from their street as their appointed ambassador on the committee. When I was elected by the residents of Dunedin Park to represent them, I put forward the idea to install an outside light at every house, as a symbol gesture to shed some light into the darkness. I was asked by the committee if we could pass that motion on to every home around Ardoin, and it was put to all of the members 
from those streets that an outside light would be fitted and left on at night. And the light was to show a peaceful solidarity in our community and thankfully the motion was carried. It didn't take long until the streets around Ardoin were glowing. The next thing before the committee was to rebuild every house that had been burned and Protestant tenants moved out. The committee suggests ways to tackle jobs ahead. Various businesses were approached and asked for donations to help rebuild the houses. Then it went to the people of the district. The call went out to every man and woman and child who could dig a hole or paint, slap on, put up a scaffold or donate any of their time to this project. They could become members of the committee. The response was amazing. Volunteers came from everywhere to help. Builders, sparks, plumbers, a large number of labourers were standing in line. It was quite clear that nothing would stop the reconstruction of these houses. The troubles were now reaching their peak as local politicians were asking the British government to send in a peacekeeping force. Jerry Fitt and John Hume were men leading the way and appealed to the British government to send over the British army. Eventually the call was heard and for the first time the professionals appeared on the streets of Northern Ireland. Ironically, the British Army had arrived just after all the women and children had been moved out from their homes in Ardoin. Only the men were left to defend their homes with hurly bats and fists. And it is a fact that murder squads from Scotland had come over to Belfast to join in a fight to wipe out the Catholics from Ardoin. A further fuel to the fire was gangs of Protestant mobs that included B-Specials and the RUC that would never surrender until there were no Catholics left in Ardoin. So in the evening when the British army arrived, it was a blow to the belly of the beast, and when the British army took up residence in the occupied territories of these streets, the thugs and the villains around the province lay low for the first time, and it was quiet for a week or two. It was party time at first for the British Army as people waved at them driving around the place in their armoured cars and tanks. The streets almost seemed safe. Most of the Catholic people were glad to see the British Army at first. They welcomed the return of law and order and when the b Specials became an illegal force it looked for a while like the civil rights movement had won. At last people spoke of an equality No one in the minority, and no longer would Catholics be manipulated and trodden underfoot. No longer would Catholics be turned away. No one really expected this illusion, and in reality, it never happened. An unrest, an uneasy peace, lasted but for a brief moment in time, and a new situation erupted. The IRA began their offensive against the British Army. The night internment was introduced, the IRA went all out in Ardoin. For some, it was their last stand. Death or freedom was the cry, as the gun battle never let up. <coughs> the British Army kicked in the front doors and dragged out all the men and boys who were 16 years of age. They are put into the army camps and prisons without a fair trial. Many families were left without a father, husband, son, brother. And feeling better, fear crept into their hearts. And all those who had welcomed the British Army now felt let down. They couldn't trust England and the occupation of their army. The troubles escalated with daily rioting and looting. Young men grew up and took up a gun as their fathers spent their days in prison and internment camps. Locked behind the wire of Long Cash and other internment camps, an entire generation of men had to accept the law that had put them there. On the outside, a new breed of freedom fighters emerged, ruthless and relentless, in their cause to push England out of Ireland. There was car bombs and kidnapping, killing and confusion, with new electronic warfare and double agents (coughs) employed on all sides of the divide. (coughs) It was passed around the various paramilitary groups in Northern Ireland, and now no one felt safe. Answering a knock on the door, 
And when anyone left the front door at any time of the day, they were never sure of their return. A rent strike had been in existence along with gas meter strikes in the Catholic districts. Anti-social behaviour had crept into every corner of the city. Every community had to have its own police force. The IRA kept things under control with kneecapping jobs, tar and featherings, punishment shootings. In the social scene, drink was all the go. A new breed with a new culture emerged. With a new blend of music and new songs were being heard in the pubs all over Belfast. Everyone stood and watched as houses burned all down around them. Times followed, brought a gritty substance to the expression, give this day our daily bread. The church seats were not as popular as they once were, and many's a hard question was being asked. Families began to hurt deeply, and hunger for justice cried aloud. God seemed absent there, and grief filled every household in the district. Hard times indeed. Factories were burned to the ground, as were many small businesses, and soon the intimidations began. It was dangerous to travel to jobs, and those who did claim their job found out that it went on to claim their life. Somehow I found an escape hatch at 12 years of age. I was given a second-hand six-string guitar from Ronnie, who was going steady with my eldest sister at the time, Marion. I never knew much about music, but I soon began to pick up tunes from the radio. My mother heard me playing a little piece called of Mouthful of Grass, which was the B-side of a song called All Right Now by Free. She was also very impressed and told my dad, and he bought me a guitar book at Smithfield Markets. The book was called Play in a Day, and in a week I was able to strum three chords, F, C and G. I often escaped to the attic and worked on chord progressions. When I was 14 years old, I met my first girlfriend. Her name was Sheila. She was the friend of my sister Geraldine. I was very shy at first, but it didn't take Sheila long to bring me out of my shell. We went to discos together, and we became good friends. The troubles were still going on, and driving my mother into a nervous wreck. Finally, she asked Dad to get us away from it all. In desperation, Dad put us onto an application form for emigration to Australia. It all happened so quickly. It was April 1972 and we had been accepted for immigration and had two weeks to leave Belfast and enter Australia into a new life. I told my friends and Sheila the sad news. No one could believe it. It was devastating for me at 16 to leave Belfast behind. Everything that meant anything to me in my life. The last week was hectic. I was lucky to get away in the end. The British Army had come to our door and warned everyone to stay back because they wanted to take me away. My mother and father told them we'd be leaving for Australia within the week. The Major was shocked but told us never to return as we were lucky to be getting out of Northern Ireland. The last night I left Sheila home I was in tears. As we stood at her front gate, I turned back, looked away from her and walked away. As I walked home along out in the drive, a sniper from the end of the street opened up with a semi-automatic weapon. I hit the deck and could almost feel the bullets whizzing past my ears. Some women came to their door and shouted over to see if I was okay. As soon as the gunman stopped to reload, I made a dash for the nearest garden wall and dived over into safety. Morning came and I got up with the thought that this day would be my last day in my home. It struck like a dagger in my heart. As all of us had a last look around, the sadness grew and grew. With the taxi finally arriving to bring us down to the docks, I was shattered. My dad placed seven suitcases into the boot of the taxi and on the roof as all of the neighbourhood stood at their doors waving goodbye. The tears that fell from my eyes made it hard to take a last look at the black mountain and the gentle hue of the sky. The morning sun peered over the rooftops of our dawn, but there was no warmth in its kiss. I felt cold and grey inside. As I looked at my mum and dad, I could see their heavy hearts, heavily disguised, very well by the nervous smile of apprehension, but it was plain to see the emptiness written all over their faces. 
As we all piled into the taxi, it was a bit like getting into your grave. The home we had would soon be dead to us, as would be our friends and relations. We slowed our head off down the street, and in about 20 minutes we arrived at the Belfast docks, where the morning had just begun. As the ship pulled out of Belfast, Louth, all I had in my heart was sadness. I took a long look at the city that I had grown up in, and I had loved, and I thought to myself, how many tears have filled this cold Irish sea? Our broken hearts were carried away, and in the morning we had docked in England. We all stood there on a railway station like seven lost sheep bound for Heathrow Airport with a destination, Sydney, over 10,000 miles away on the other side of the world. Two days passed in the sky on a 747 jumbo jet with the plane finally touching down at Muscat Airport in Sydney. I felt as if I'd walked straight through into the twilight zone. Everything was strange and we felt for the first time complete strangers and a burden on all those officials who were there, checking us out through customs. As we spoke to some of them, I thought maybe how smart we are. For I could understand every word they said, but they couldn't understand us. Eventually we were all put on a bus, feeling ever so humble and frightened in this vast new country. All the way to Westbridge Hostel we spoke in a friendly way to the driver who never responded to a word we said, and we thought to ourselves, what sort of country are we in? But how ironically funny it was when we discovered the bus driver was deaf. We got off the bus and walked to our new accommodation on jelly-like knees and dragged our jelly jet lag buddies to the office where we signed in and picked up the keys to our flats in the new home that we were at in the Gurney Hostel called Gordon. We walked off from the administration building feeling the same, very homesick, in a mild state of shock. But above everything, a sense of freedom and peace captured us. No sound of gunfire ripped over our heads. No bombs were exploding. And there was no sign of trouble anywhere. We seemed to have lost our way to Gordon Flats and stopped a few passers-by to ask directions. And what a shock we got when we found everybody we spoke to couldn't speak English. We wondered, is it true? Did we come to the right country? After a while walking in circles, we finally found the area called Gordon and looked for our flat numbers. We were exhausted by the stage. Finally found our flats to be all upstairs units. As mum and dad opened up flat seven, my sisters opened up flat eight. I followed mum and dad and we dropped our suitcases on the floor. We were welcomed by a chilling scream from flat eight. Don, my father ran out from the flat like a madman with mum behind him, myself closely after them. When we got there, we stood in horror, looking at this huge black hairy spider that clung to the white concrete wall. It was the size of a small puppy dog. My father grabbed the nearest thing he could find, what happened to be a broom in the bathroom, and without any hesitation he whacked the spider like almost seven times he whacked it. But it didn't make any impression. The spider seemed stunned and it finally fell from the wall to the floor. Dad stood on top of it, and we all breathed a sigh of relief. We had never before seen the legs of this monster. All we ever had in Belfast was daddy long legs on the window pane, but this was something else. Mum went back across to unpack as Dad and I stayed with the girls to calm them down. Suddenly Mum began to scream for help, and... Again, like a madman, like a lion after a kill, Dad jumped to his feet and raced out the door with me after him. As we got inside the unit Mum was standing in, she was pointing into the living room where there on the wall was another hairy puppy dog spider, even bigger than the other one. Even the hairs had hairs. It was clinging to the wall, motionless and very much alive. On the sofa was the Sydney Morning Herald, 
that had just bought at the airport. He grabbed it and began to thump the spider, blow after blow from the wall. It lay there, helpless, lifeless, upon the vinyl floor. What a welcome and what a night we spent in our flat in Sydney. I never slept at all and could only think of Belfast. In the morning, Dad was so upset about the spiders that he went immediately to the administration block to make a complaint. But to his surprise... The officer there just laughed and said that those insects had been placed into all the empty flats to kill the cockroaches. When Mum heard this, she began to hit the panic button. She wanted to return home right away. And she wasn't on her own. There with that, let me tell you. I had just remembered I had left all my poetry and prayers back in our down under the floorboards and behind the bootcases in our house in Dunedin Park. I blamed it on the hurry to get out of Belfast and I felt a big part of me was still over there. But that part of me was gone. I couldn't see it, I couldn't touch it and I felt as if I had been robbed of something. From that day my homesickness increased. Seconds passed like hours, hours passed like weeks and weeks seemed like years. This new country began to feel like a prison. I had been locked away from a life I loved and from all the friends I had who were gone now. And God knows I missed them dearly. Each morning we stood in line with the other inmates at Westbridge Hostel waiting for breakfast at the canteen. We'd been there almost two months and in that time nobody could understand us. There were Greeks, Italians, Germans and other new Australians but not one of our inmates spoke English. I suppose this was the main driving force that made me put pen to paper again. In my new adopted home, I found myself beginning to write in a different, complete way than I had ever done before. I felt a new writer emerging from the depths of the heart and it was from there I expressed emotions that gouged out the words that fell somewhere between poetry and prose. Then I knew if ever I was to settle that my writing would have to transform itself and also settle into these new surroundings. The end of chapter one.